This is lesson 13.6, Baroque art. Going to see a lot of art today. What was Baroque art in painting, sculpture, architecture, and music, especially painting? College Board Topic 2.7 deals with the art of the 16th century, mannerism and Baroque. Notice how the College Board likes to stick mannerism and Baroque together. Our textbook likes to stick the Renaissance and man mannerism together. Mannerism is kind of a bridge between the Renaissance and Baroque. And I kind of agree with the textbook because a lot of uh, artists that we associate with the Renaissance were actually mannerist artists, like, for example, Michelangelo. Explain how and why artistic ex expression changed from 1450 to 1648. And we're actually going to go a little bit later than that as well. And 2.7 makes this point. Mannerist and Baroque artists employed distortion, drama, and illusion in their work. Monarchies, city-states, and the church commissioned these works as a means of promoting their own stature and power. And then we get into a little bit of 18th century culture and arts, going all the way up to topic 4.5 in, in Unit 4. Explain how European cultural and intellectual life was maintained and changed throughout the period from 1648 to 1815, and that is actually period 2. And it says, the arts moved from the celebration of religious themes and royal power to an emphasis on private life and the public good. And we're going to see that especially with the Northern Baroque or the Dutch Baroque. And then it says, until 1715, Baroque art and music promoted religious feeling and was employed by monarchs to illustrate state power. And you see those two aspects of Baroque art, religious feeling, state power. And we're going to expand on that in this lesson. And then a little bit later, 18th century art and literature increasingly reflected the outlook and values of commercial and bourgeois society. And like I said, especially in the North. And then neoclassicism expressed new Enlightenment ideals of citizenship and political participation. And the Enlightenment, that's a little bit later from us. We might touch on that a little bit today. So where are we? Everywhere, Italy, especially Italy, and the Dutch Republic, and Flanders, and a little bit of Spain and France and Germany. And so you've got some major Baroque players in art, like Caravaggio, and Regal, and Gian Lorenzo Bernini, Peter Paul Rubens, Diego Velasquez. So we're going to see a little bit of all these guys. And uh, Zerberon and Jan Vermeer, Artemisia Gentileschi, Rembrandt, Johann Sebastian Bach, musician. And so here's our introduction. The meaning of the word Baroque. That says a lot about the intention behind the movement because the word Baroque was a Portuguese word, Baroca, and it meant a pearl of irregular shape, and it implied strangeness and irregularity and extravagance. And art critics started using the word Baroque in the late 18th century, so uh, kind, of, kind of after it was beginning to end, really, to describe art that was, number one, overblown, and number two, unbalanced. And for these art critics, the Baroque, that word Baroque was not a positive term. It was a negative term. And so Baroque is just over the top, going to extremes. And you can really see that in this painting right here, The Incredulity of St. Thomas by, by Caravaggio in 1603. And in this painting, he is just going over the top because you, what you see here is you see Jesus literally guiding Thomas's fingers into the hole in his side that was made by a Roman spear while he was being crucified. And, you know, in the biblical story in the book of John, Jesus invited Thomas to do that, if that's what he needed to stop doubting because he was being a doubting Thomas. But in the story, uh, Thomas was like, no, I'm good. I don't need to do that. This is Baroque art right here. And so in Baroque art, Caravaggio goes over the top. He takes a story above and beyond, and uh, he gives us the drama of Thomas going for it and sticking his fingers inside Jesus' body. And it just kind of makes you go, ooh, you know, and that's kind of what Caravaggio is wanting to do. And so the Baroque movement lasted from about 1600 to about 1750, 
and it was preceded by Renaissance and by Mannerism. So those were the two things that came before it, and the Baroque's kind of in the middle, and then what came after it, well, and we'll really look at this with the Enlightenment, is Rococo and Neoclassicism. And Baroque originated in Italy, and it tended to spread to Catholic countries, although there were notable exceptions. For example, not as popular in Catholic France. And there was also a significant Baroque movement in the northern Protestant countries. So there's exceptions to, to this general rule that it tended to spread to Catholic countries. The Baroque movement was a product of, of times of religious and political violence and controversy. And you can associate the Baroque with three things. I mean, think about what has come before the Baroque. You've had, um, a, you've had a Protestant Reformation. You've had a Catholic Counter-Reformation. And you've had these wars of religion that have gone on. And all of these have influenced the Baroque. And so the first thing that you can associate with Baroque is those wars of religion, especially the Thirty Years' War. These were prevalent in Europe, and turbulent, turbulent times were reflected by turbulent art. So the Baroque was often melodramatic and bombastic and over the top. It rejected the restraint and the order and the stillness, and we're going to see some differences there, and the balance of Renaissance art. You can look at this painting by Peter Paul Rubens, Battle of the Amazons, and there's just so much going on there that you can't even take it all in. Colors were rich. They were brighter than bright and darker than dark, and you had light and shadow contrasting each other. Both of these paintings were by uh, Sasso Ferrato, and look at the contrast and the saturated colors in Mary between what's going on with her, and then there's just nothing at all behind her. Baroque featured bodies that were in violent motion, restless forms, constant movement. And uh, for, for example, if you look at the Renaissance, look at the statues of David that we saw, Michelangelo's David, Donatello's David. What's happening? Um, you know, David is just standing there right, in a kind of a contrapposto position. But in this thing by Gentileschi, uh, actually Artemisia Gentileschi's father, well, look at this. He is in the middle. He's swinging that sword right there. So there's a big difference there between Renaissance and Baroque. If you see um, Artemisia Gentileschi's uh, painting right here of, of uh, Judith cutting the head off of Holofernes, well, you know, he, she's right in the middle of the action. And uh, there's a fascinating story behind that particular painting, which I believe Tom Ritchie tells, which uh, I think you'd find very interesting. Another movement that interacted with the Baroque was a movement that we will study in great detail in Chapter 15, Absolutism and the Consolidation of Political Power. Now, we've been talking about the consolidation of political power ever since Lesson 12, 5, remember that? And so monarchs who aspired to be absolute monarchs and wield absolute power used Baroque to impress their, their majesty and their power upon their peers and as well as their subjects. And remember, we identified that strategy as one of the important things you do in order to consolidate power if you're a king who wants to, to centralize his authority. So this was especially true in portraiture. And so you've got some really famous portraits here, especially the one on the right of Louis XIV. Baroque was embraced especially by the Catholic Habsburg courts in Madrid, Prague, Vienna, and Brussels. These Habsburgs were all over the place. And Baroque was initially resisted in England and France and the Netherlands, although it started to really catch on in the Netherlands, and eventually it spread all over Europe and even to Latin America. Number three movement, the most significant force behind the Baroque, was the Catholic Reformation. The papacy and the Jesuits used Baroque art 
to increase the appeal and the excitement and the enthusiasm behind Catholicism. The Catholic Church, it's going through this new revitalization, this new confidence, and they want to project that new confidence to the world. It was a rejection of this Protestant argument, this Protestant notion, oh, that Catholicism, it's just nothing but external empty ritual and going through the motions and detachment from God. There's just, there's no real true spirituality to the Catholic Church. Well, the Catholic Church, in the midst of this Catholic Reformation, wanted to encourage religious art that featured drama and passion and emotion and intensity, and dare I say it, yes, even ecstasy. And the message was that Catholicism had all the spiritual excitement and the raw emotional experience that Protestantism had, if not more. It was exciting. It was a great spiritual adventure to be a Catholic, and that's what they're trying to say. And so its purpose was to inspire ordinary churchgoers to connect spiritually. And we've got um, one of the most famous Baroque statues, the Ecstasy of Teresa of Avila by Bernini. And we've talked about uh, St. Teresa of Avila when we talked about the Catholic Reformation and in particular some of these orders like the Carmelites. And she was instrumental in um, reforming some of these orders and making them more focused, more ascetic, and uh, more disciplined. Remember that? That goes back to the to our Catholic Reformation lesson. And we talked about, when we talked about Teresa of Avila, we talked about how she became extremely ill and how she went through about two years of almost nonstop religious visions. And she journaled those and kept detailed notes of those. And some of those descriptions were extremely vivid and even sensual and even ecstatic. And so when you, you look at this statue, where is Bernini getting his information? Well, he's getting this information from the notations of Teresa of Avila herself. And so she wrote about all of her visions in such detail. And this is Teresa of Avila's own description of a vision of a visit from an angel which inspired her for the rest of her life and which Bernini used as the basis for this very sculpture. And this is what Teresa of Avila wrote. I saw in his hand a long spear of gold, and at the point there seemed to be a little fire. He appeared to me to be thrusting it at times into my heart and to pierce my very entrails. And when he drew it out, he seemed to draw them out also and to leave me all on fire fire with a great love of God. The pain was so great that it made me moan, and yet so surpassing was the sweetness of this excessive pain that I could not wish to be rid of it. And that description is what Bernini is sculpting. Well, Northern Baroque, also known as, as Dutch Baroque, tended to feature more secular themes so you've got Dutch and Flemish painters like Jan Vermeer and Rembrandt. They were prominent, and it featured everyday people and townscapes, and portraits were very popular. And we'll talk about how Dutch religious and cultural sensibilities impacted their art when we get to Lesson 15.5. So Italy and Northern Europe kind of did an artistic swap between the Renaissance art and Baroque art because Italy became more religious. Remember, because remember, it was the Italian and the Italian Renaissance, those guys were more secular. And now they're switching places. Italy is becoming more religious, and it's the North that's becoming more secular. One glaring exception to this Northern European trend towards secularism was Peter Paul Rubens. He was Flemish. He was from Flanders. We would call kind of call that Belgium today, the northern half of Belgium. And um, he studied in Italy. He was a devout Catholic. And so he had a lot of religious themes to his paintings. However, he also did many secular and classical subjects as well as portraits. Here's three of his most famous ones. Baroque sculpture 
reflected the same sensibilities as Baroque paintings. And this is the Assumption of Mary at the Altar of the Assumption Pilgrimage Church in Bavaria. And, you know, I've got a kind of a wide shot that shows you where it is hanging over the altar. And then here's some close-ups, which just show the wonder and the ecstasy that Mary is feeling as she is being assumed up into heaven, which is kind of funny because in the story, I, she is actually dead when her body is taken up to, into heaven. But I guess that doesn't matter. And then this is where the Bernini one is, you know, the ec ecstasy of St. Teresa. It is over this altar here in Rome. And so you can kind of see where it is. And you can see the close-up of how he depicted the emotions on her face. Baroque churches and palaces were magnificent and richly detailed. Remember, the idea is going over the top, over-decorate. Don't pull any punches. Just go for the whole thing. There was even Baroque furniture. Right? It's a Baroque table, and you can just look at the, the ornate detail that's going on with this table. There's even Baroque rooms where you take a whole room and decorate it just over the top fancy. Baroque music. Johann Sebastian Bach, he was German. He was a Lutheran, not a Catholic. He was a Lutheran. And he composed the Sunday liturgy for the same church for 27 years. So every time they needed new music, every week, every occasion, he composed that music. And so over a 27-year career, he's regarded as one of the greatest composers of Western music. He composed liter literally hundreds of pieces of music, both secular music and religious music. And so the ornateness of his music followed Baroque principles. Here is a little gallery of additional Baroque art and architecture that you should be able to recognize. Remember, Counter-Reformation of the Church and art and architecture all go together. So you got St. Peter's Basilica, Vatican City. And Bernini, our sculptor, helped to design this. The Church of Weltenberg. This is the altar in Germany. You should be able to recognize that. Oh, yeah, another altar, Altar of Mercy in German, Germany, 1764. St. Francis in Ecstasy. There's Caravaggio again, right? Uh, ecstasy is a big theme with these Catholic Baroque painters. The Flagellation of Christ by Caravaggio, and you can see twisted figures, lots of drama, suffering, tension. David and Goliath, Caravaggio, in the midst of cutting Goliath's head off, right? Not getting ready to, not thinking about it, doing it. Salome with the head of John the Baptist, right? And again, it just makes, it's got a visceral effect. It makes you go, oh, gross, which is his uh, purpose. And there's all this drama there. The card sharps, not card sharks, although the kid right here in the foreground looks like he's a card shark because he's cheating. He's hiding cards in the back, in, you know, behind his belt. And then the dead Christ mourned. Always very dramatic. You can see, look at their faces, look at all the emotion going on. Got the Virgin appearing to St. Hyacinth. Uh, Joseph's bloody coat brought to Jacob. And look at Jacob on the right. He's freaking out because they're trying to tell him that his very favorite son is dead. And then this is another Velasquez painting Christ on the cross. And then you've got this common moment right here. St. Francis in meditation, right? And of course, you know what that skull that, is, that he's holding means. That is always a symbol of mortality. St. Bonaventure on his deathbed. And you can see all the various reactions and all the drama going on. And, of course, the elevation of the cross. Peter Paul Rubens. The Lamentation. Peter Paul Rubens again. 
And then you've got a secular painting, right? The village feta. And uh, a feta is basically a party. This is The Garden of Love by Peter Paul Rubens. And so this is a more secular theme right here. It's tons of things going on. The Dutch painters. Well, you, of course, you've got Rembrandt. Self-portrait. There's what he looked like. And uh, one of the things that we'll discover when, in Lesson 15.5 five, is the Dutch were really into painting everyday things, especially people just working normal everyday jobs. They liked to raise that up to a new level of respect. People doing work, people doing what they normally do every day. For example, The Milkmaid by Jan Vermeer. Music lesson, just giving somebody a music lesson. Let's paint that, let's document that, and lift that up and make it respectable. The, cart the geographer. And then, then we've got portraits of famous personalities of the times. This was Bernini's bust of Louis XIV. And the bust of Cardinal Richelieu, who we will discuss soon. And here's a portrait of Cardinal Richelieu, or, you know, a full-body portrait. 